Welcome to Hero or Disruptor, exploring the power of teaching metaphors. I'm Garth Neufeld. In this series, Jane Hallinan and I take a deep dive into the hero's journey as applied to teaching, while also considering the transformational power of disruption. So where will you see yourself? As a guide to the next generation of heroes? Or as a disruptor of the status quo? Wherever you find yourself, thanks for joining us on this journey. Jane, do you have any idea what we talked about? Uh, it seems like uh, forever ago. It, it was only two weeks ago, and I have a dim idea of what we talked about. The worst part is I have an even dimmer idea of what we're going to talk about today. Oh, well, well. Um, okay, so I think that uh, our last conversation, we, we went to a, a few different places, uh, but one of the themes that came up for me were barriers um, uh, for, for students and for instructors. And we also talked about, if I, if I remember correctly, um, that the, this transformation process uh, and, and really uh, what I would call kind of the hero journey is, is really uh, about students and instructors. And so we were kind of trying to tease out the difference. Uh, do you recall anything else from that? Um, it's a blur. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, we also uh, talked a little bit about uh, alchemy um, and mm -hmm. uh, and and the way that you see all these things working together. Um, so here's yeah, what I think, I, I think that yeah, was ahead. one of one of my metaphors that has helped guide uh, teaching decisions that I make. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so I was, I was kind of thinking through, like, what are our next steps on this? And I know that we've used uh, different meta metaphors. Uh, and I think that even in your meta metaphor of um, uh, or, or the, the way that you think about teaching right now is to um, put students a little off center, um, um, mm -hmm. a little on tilt so that um, to spur on growth. I, I do want to just tap into that a little bit because in the hero's journey, the first thing I was, I think we got a little ahead of ourselves because the first thing that happens in the hero's journey is something happens. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll explain that further, but I was kind of just reading about it again and I thought, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So um, of course this is my metaphor, but I think it, we're going to find this connection here. And um, in, in, and I, I don't know exactly what this is going to look like in the classroom, but here it is uh, at the, the student is living in an ordinary world. This is the idea that they are coming in. Uh, I, I suppose this would be the first day of class. Here's another class. It's ordinary. And then something happens. It ignites the call. Um, for you, I imagine that's putting students. It's the first time that you disturb the peace. Um, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know that we've talked about the first time you disturb the peace with students. I think maybe we have, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, well, I think I've mentioned in the past that uh, my metaphor journey has been from juggler to alchemist to disturber of the peace. And while I think I carry forward some of those elements, I still juggle content. I still think of the class as kind of a magical place. Um, for me, disturbing the peace is I, I do want students to come into my class and um, be a bit off balance about where we're going to go. Um, and that, uh, that might be that, um, uh, they, they certainly have a well laid out calendar. This is what we're going to talk about. These are the assignments, but I can very easily depart from what I have planned if something better presents itself in the course of conversation. So I, I actually had an example of this yesterday. In my social psychology class, I right now I'm blessed with maybe one of the most fun group of students I've ever had in social psychology. They're just game for anything. And as we're assembling and I'm working on the technology, something that this, I despise because it takes me away from students on the front end of the class, um, a student walked in and said, uh, Dr. Hallinan, I, I've got this problem that only you can fix. It's like, oh, well, this is going to be, whatever this is going to be, it's going to be good. And the example was, 
my sister refuses to use GPS and I need to figure out how to talk her into it. And if anyone can can tell me how to do that, you can. So I, I sort of made fun of the situation. It's like, well, I'm sure I'm the only one in the world that could give you advice, except no, that's not how this is going to work. Let's in fact put aside what it was I was going to do immediately. And since we just studied persuasion in this class, let's call on the experts in the class to see what they would suggest as uh, how you would get your sister to use GPS. And sure enough, you know, I said, okay, you're going to need a little cook time to do this and I'll, and I'll wait. And so that's part of what is a little bit disturbing because students are not always used to having silence in the classroom. But sure enough, a little wait time and students started popping out really good ideas that were linked to what they just learned. And then everything was fine until that student said, well, can you tell me why she does that? It's like, no, this is not going to be a clinical intervention. Sorry. This is social psychology. This is this is that's that's what we're going to do. But I think I think that uh, suggests a, a kind of mix of I love the magic that happens when you're confident enough in what you're doing that you can you can step aside from the plan and go with where the students want to be. And yeah. clearly they they liked getting thrown off balance that way. I'm I'm reminded how lucky we are that we teach a discipline that is so incredibly interesting to students. Uh, I, I sometimes feel bad for my, my math uh, faculty colleagues who uh, have a very different first day experience probably with their students than I do. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Right, and right. Normally on a first day, on the very first day of class, um, one thing that's going to happen is everybody has to say something. Everyone must, no matter how large the class is, everyone must talk in some capacity. And it's usually going to be some capacity related to the class. Um, I have this, uh, it's probably not a legitimate idea, but if students speak even once on the first day, they're going to be more likely to speak in class when we're talking about important things. And yet I know as soon as I say, all right, time for introductions, we're going to do this, and this is how we're going to do it. And Everyone speaks. You can see big eyeballs like, oh, you know, that's not what I do in class. Well, you do it in this class because this is this is what we're going to do. And um, uh, I don't know. I, I've never done an outcome study to see if that strategy pays off in terms of students being comfortable. But um, uh, I do think students come to expect that I'm going to be pushing them around a little bit to be able yeah. to ask them to do what I want them to do. Yeah. You know, your example of a student bringing in a real life problem, even though it was a fun one, uh, but mm -hmm. a, a real life problem that gets addressed as a part of education. Uh, I think that we can kind of zoom that out and say that uh, there is when we think about that student hero that I get called to something else. And we know that that end that we've been talking about is transformation. We, we want them to be transformed by education, um, that some of these kinds of very practical things are going to happen. But here's my question. We are, I, let me just say this. I don't, I guess this is a kind of a personal perspective thing that human beings in the United States, let's just say that um, college students, uh, we are just doing our thing, our daily routines. We probably uh, don't think a ton, especially when we're 18 years old about um, some do for sure. I didn't first, first generation college student. I was just taking <laughs> classes, right? I didn't think about where does this lead? What do I want? I'm feeling inspired. I need to go get it. Um, this is the ordinary life that the, that, that the typical person um, is kind of in. And then I'm wondering when does that calling come for a student and, and hopefully it does at some point, when does that calling come where the passion is ignited? Um, how do we move from kind of this kind of sedentary, not thinking uh, about the benefit of education career? How do, how do students go from there to actually saying I'm going to leave home. I'm going to leave this ordinary life and I'm going to go for it right now. Uh, I'm sure because you get more time with your students that you've probably seen this more than I have actually, but. 
Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's true or not, um, uh-huh. but I think uh, I'm going to say it reinforces one of the ideas that you've been talking about in the hero's journey, that for people to become on fire with something, that there's usually going to be an influential mentor that will do that, whether it's an individual who is teaching you in the discipline, which is often the case, that you get inspired because this person's style or this person's humanity or this person's brilliance appeals to you and makes you feel at home, um, or, or whether it's just that the, the content that you're studying is so intrinsically interesting, at the level that you turn on fire, um, some, some confluence of those events. And of course, there are students that don't ever get there. I mean, yeah. that's one of the sad things. And in fact, I was thinking of this in connection with something we've talked about uh, before, more privately, and that's specs grading. You know, that as I hear about specs grading and trying to bundle things, it's like, I'm I'm a little worried about using specs grading because I don't want to give up on students who want to surrender to lower levels of performance. Um, And so that, that for me, working with students to be able to get them to get excited about the life of the mind is one of the great pleasures of what we do. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to I have every opportunity to persuade them that what we do is fun and valuable. Yeah. And again, because we teach the discipline we teach, I think it's a little easier to do uh, with our discipline. Uh, but maybe we could talk more generally about students. And we've last, last time we talked, we talked about barriers. Um, I want to take a little bit of a different kind of uh, look at this, which is, what what are the things that are going on in a student's life where education is an answer to the problem that they that they have? Um, I could see that, and we've heard these stories um, probably from students and other people that generationally we've not not come my parents weren't educated my grandparents weren't educated we lived in poverty essentially i'm the first person in my family to ever go to college and i am doing it to make a generational change for you know so that is that's a that's a fiery one for sure Uh, it's a a lovely first gen hero saga isn't it yes and it's also my first gen hero saga i'm first gen yep yep me too yeah uh what so that's a pretty obvious one to me. Can we brainstorm? What are the other, and, and maybe it doesn't happen with the decision to go to college, but maybe at some point, like at what point does a student look at their lives, potentially some of them and say, oh, this is why um, that student might say, I want to make a generational change. That's why I'm going to get educated. What are those other callings? Well, I think we can't divorce that from the choice that students make in uh, choosing psychology as a major, because so many of our students, if you scratch the surface and say, why why are you doing this major? It is that they are trying to figure out something that is very up close and personal for them, whether that's a difficult relative or a trauma that they've had or something that... Um, our discipline in particular makes some promises that they'll have some answers if they jump in and, and give it some work. And for many students, that's more seductive. That's more powerful than the first gen saga. It's like, I, I want to I wanna become uh, a different person than my past would dictate. I want to I wanna transcend whatever the difficulties are that are inherent in the path that's already laid out for me. I'm trying to escape that. So while that may not be just, you know, all rosy and bells and whistles, it is the fact that people see education as an escape, not just as an achievement. It's an escape that you're going to be able to escape the trappings of whatever the family scripts have been. Yeah. Well, and there's that clinical piece that you're, you're going for here, which, and, and I think there's a developmental piece here too, about in, just independence in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the United States, there is this uh, cultural thing that I don't know that other countries have, like the United States has, where uh, students go away for college um, if, if they have the means. Um, mm-hmm. They go away for college. And uh, again, there is this kind of motivational piece where uh, 
you know, it's remarkable. I remember the day now it was after my undergraduate degree, but I was living at my folks house and I did went to the university of Saskatchewan in my hometown. And, uh, but I remember driving away at 22, um, to, to graduate school down in California and the feeling, and I wonder if 18 year olds have this when they leave home, uh, for college in, in, uh, in America, uh, the feeling was that this is remark. This is a journey. This is remarkably different than anything I've ever done before. Um, does your institution- as an eighteen-year-old who made that journey, I would say yes. That there, the thrill of yeah. separating yourself from your family. Yeah. If you're not going to school in the same town, I, I had that luxury. My parents saved up so that we could, I could get to college. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, just being more excited than I could practically bear to be able to embark on this new life that I didn't know what it was going to be. And I didn't know many people, any people involved in the setting where I was say I knew one person um, that just the idea that you might have the potential for a makeover was pretty exciting. Um, but I think way back when I was entering college, it was also the case that it was assumed that college was your full-time job. And that's very different than what students face today. And in fact, I think that it harkens back to obstacles again, that we are competing against social media. We are competing against working full-time. We're competing against uh, family dynamics that are much more complex than they used to be. And so trying to snag attention and create those meaningful relationships that allow students to see a different possible future for themselves that it's much, it's much harder now than it used to be, I think. Right. And maybe all the more important to have that sense of what you are being called to and having somebody who can, and probably a guide um, who can say, no, this is why you're here because um, all of these we've talked about, um, kind of gen- maybe generational change is the fire or maybe um, self-improvement or self-understanding is the the fire or maybe just independence and development. Mm-hmm. But facing all those barriers, it a, a, a student that has to be enough motivation, motivation for a student to not get overwhelmed or to, to be able to uh, continue on their journey despite the barriers, which is not always possible. Let me just Correct. say that. Yeah. It's not always a matter of, oh, I'm just going to do it because I'm committed to it. Sometimes there are other things going on. But um, I think the inspiration to do the journey has to, in order to do it, it has to exceed the barriers. <laughs> True. And I think um, one of the more powerful challenges we have is while we are about, we're dedicated to transforming students and their lives. That's not the deal they signed up for, most of yeah. them. The deal they signed up for was get a degree so they can get a job. And so we're we're proposing uh, introducing them and in, inducting them into the life of the mind when that's not that's not what they're paying their tuition for. And so that yeah. makes the challenge a little bit more serious on the the teacher end. You know, you're saying that it, it uh, it, it causes me to question the whole conversation, the whole, the whole journey, the whole transformation. Um, you know, this is a very romantic idea, right? Um, and probably a true one. I think it's a, a true one. But if a student is coming to get a, a, a degree in yeah. order to get a job, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong with that. And in my way of thinking, it's an open door that I've got, I've got a shot at being able to help them develop some pride in having a mind that works really well. And if I have to, you know, if I have to use, you want to be a success in the workplace, then try this. Um, I'm I'm certainly not above uh, invoking what values will help motivate that particular student to be successful. And this is your, your challenge uh, when you think about something like specifications grading is giving students these, some students, um, they will see the low bar and say, that's good enough for me and never open the door toward to the high bar. Right. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So it, it reminds me a little bit of options that um, I had as an undergraduate, which I could take some courses pass fail. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm, I was your basic, I'm going to get an A student. And then when I get in the pass fail courses, would I work like I was an A student? I would not. No. I'd go, well, you know, if I want to go to class today, I won't. And that I think undercuts what it is we're really trying to do with students. We're trying to empower them to um, see intellectual life as a good and valuable thing that right. they want to invest in, as opposed to just check off the box and move on to the next class. Yeah. 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 And I, and I like the idea, even for spec grading, that you could um, start in one place and then mm -hmm. you could make a decision later to, for, for example, go, go for an A instead of a C. So a good instructor might find a way to make that possible. But a good instructor also helps a disengaged student, gives them the opportunity to stick around and then become engaged eventually. Correct. And we don't get to choose when that happens. <laughs> we don't. And, and we, we, don't, we don't necessarily know all of the contingencies going on in their lives. I'm, I'm um, thinking of uh, some group dynamics that I'm working with in some of my classes right now where, you know, we're, we just pass midterms. And so the project groups that I have in my advanced classes, when students are opting to socially loaf, it's starting to show some wear and tear on the groups. And so I had to do an intervention this week on a group to see if I could not get them to implode. Um, the stance that sometimes gets said is, you know, I, 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 lead such a, I lead such a busy life as though no one else in the circle that mm -hmm. you're talking to leads a busy life. I think students can sometimes get swept up in, I, you know, yes, I'm overcommitted and and um, I, I have too many, too many things going on. And so I, ca I just can't make school a priority. Like, well, OK, that's your choice. But think what you're doing to yourself long term. What are you what are you putting ahead of school? Mm -hmm. And if let, let's be frank, do you think you're going to be able to come and talk to me about a letter of reference when you're not giving me maximum effort? You're not because I'm going to say no. Because I'm, I want you to, I want you to find maximum effort, and so sometimes that uh, startling conversation can sometimes shake things up enough that you can get people back on the path before it's too late. But this is sort of the the period of the semester where here's your shot to be able to see what's fixable or if it's all just going to go to hell in a pan basket. Yeah, I, I get some of that same response when I. Um contact students about missing assignments but but and and he, i'm always shocked at how many times students are um their attitude isn't uh well screw this class their added their their response is um oh oh my goodness i'm so busy i just or i got behind or this thing happened and and uh, I want you to know <laughs> that I'm going to work really hard. And I hear that over and over again. I mean, they really care what we think about them. You I know? think that's probably true for most. I wouldn't say all, no. but I uh -huh. think that's, you know, there's, there is uh, sometimes a, a little percentage of students that are, they're just there to mark time and you could stand on your head and spit <laughs> $500 bills. And that would not, I mean, they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. They're just going to put in their time. And the, I think the key for us is not to let that uh, that low marker of energy in class distract us and keep us from trying our best to engage the people who are at least willing to go there with us. Yeah. You know, if, if I just review kind of this conversation, I, I in my in my mind here as we're, we're closing, I think uh, calling telling students what the calling is so that they know what they are, what, what's, what's available to them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's a little bit of inspiration um, and giving them a big picture about what is education. Education isn't this course or this reading. It's uh, a larger picture. And then keeping that door open for them to walk through when they decide to walk through it, I think is kind of what, what I'm taking away from this. Yeah, I think I think that's important. I think students um, may need some time to pass. I mean, sometimes sometimes what we do has time release, and we may be making an impact that we don't see, but we find out a year or two later when students email and say, "You know what you said this day made a big difference in my life." When you get yeah. those 
those lovely kinds of comments. It's so great. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I think uh, there's nothing more joyous than watching a student realize the potential that they have. Um, yeah. That's what makes our job fun. And if we go back to your comment about how lucky we are, oh my God, are we lucky to be teaching in psychology? Because I think you have to be pretty awful to make a psychology class boring. <laughs> Yeah. And I know there are people who can manage that, but you're starting out with the, the very best material there is and students being at least open on the front end to having you bring them into the conversation. And I, our peers in other disciplines don't quite have that same advantage. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, you know, you were just a, a minute ago, you, it was reminding me that one of the stages of the hero's journey early on is the refusal, the hero's refusal. They get the call and they refuse. And what you said is, you know, you may not see it until later. It may look like a refusal, but, um, you know, they have to have the opportunity. Um, and, and so we, we don't ever want to take that from them. And I, I think it's easy to get disheartened as an instructor when you see uh, students not take the opportunity, not get it. Uh, but you just never know. And, and so, yeah, we live for those messages from students, right, from the past. We do. And I think that's also why it's so crushing when you see the flip side of students who not only don't engage, but who see education as sort of a game, a sport in which they can cheat their way to get stuff to minimize their effort. And when you discover that as a teacher, um, I, I don't think they understand how soul crushing that is for us because mm -hmm. of what it says about the lapse in trust and the mismatch in motives and uh, everything that that entails. And so uh, it, it really speaks to us to try to figure out what can we do to facilitate students working from the shining place as best they can. They need to be able to understand this is about character. This is, this is about so much more. It's the context that you were talking about. It's more than just the fact that you're going to be studying positive psychology, it's how does this relate to your life? How does this relate to your career? How does this relate to the person that you want to become? Yeah. Well, I think this is a nice place to end because next week's conversation, I believe mm -hmm. we are going to talk about when the guide shows up, when the guide who is the instructor shows up on this journey that these students are going on. And, and we all know, uh, I could think of, Many, many conversations on psych sessions with, uh, that I've had with uh, some very good teachers who were either inspired because or in spite of uh, a, a, a guide that, that or somebody who was supposed to be a guide. And so mm -hmm. um, maybe we could even kind of come up with our own uh, guide stories, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, I, Jane. Sadly, I have both good and bad versions, so yeah. uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to be able to talk about that. Well, good stuff. Um, thanks again for uh, chatting today. 